quite yeah. loved by the we're that the region. Awesome local band that people talk about these days. Yeah. Sale. I tore that place up. This guy tore the place up. I got kicked off the first time, and then I rocked it hard. I rocked it hard. He rocked him like nuts. Like baby, they were on fire. They were crazy. I, I gotta... In the late 1960s, a group of legendary musicians with the last name Jackson came out of Gary, Indiana and took the entertainment world by storm. About 30 years later, in the next city over, a new band formed. A band that will soon forever change entertainment and life as we know it. Ladies and gentlemen, the Flying Errands. Today, the Flying Errands are known in the Calumet region and Chicagoland area for their creative lyrics, unique sense of fashion, and out-of-this-world showmanship that would make P.T. Barnum proud. It is only a matter of time before the Flying Errands go from local clubs and parties to selling out arenas. But let us begin by taking a look back at how it all began. Well, it happened, oh, 3,000 years ago, back when, uh... Myself and Nick Jones were uh, riding on camels throughout the Yucatan Peninsula. The Flying Errands lineage can be traced back to the late 1990s punk rock band, The Pillagers. They were our, mine and Andy's first band that we ever actually performed with. And that's really the band where I kind of learned how to play music while we were in a band. I didn't really learn first. It was like learning while we were going and playing. It was uh, more serious than the Flying Errands. Musically, there were a lot of similarities. It was basic uh, foundation. For the most part, it was just more serious. Because of that, it was a little bit more difficult because we really weren't that serious. We would try to write songs about certain issues and certain aspects of uh, our moral beliefs or whatever, you know, stuff like that. All that stuff's out there already. Really, the Pillagers is like preschool to the Flying Errands as far as like music and performance. It was like training. It's like a watered-down version. We just took it to another level with the flying Aaron's. In the spring of 2001, Aaron Gonzarowski had a revelation. He uh, said he wanted to start a band because all his friends at school were in bands, and none of them were good, and they were, oh, I'm in a band, and they were bragging. I thought they were a bunch of dorks. They weren't very talented. Um, they weren't good, and I knew I was good. And I knew I had people around me that could make the best band ever local band ever. One day I went to one of their shows and I saw them play. I was not very satisfied at all. So I said, you know what Justin? I will make a band better than yours one day. Of course, Aaron Gonzarowski with his natural raw talent and cocky rock star attitude was the lead singer. Well, I don't want to sound selfish or arrogant. I'd have to say my uh, the greatest influence is uh, myself. You know, why not? I I'm way cooler than anyone else, and uh, I do things nobody does. Co-founder Andy Jones was put on keyboard and vocals. I was a bass player for about three years before uh, the Flying Errands even started. And when we started the band, Nick and I didn't want to play the instruments we played in our previous band, just for fun, because we were in two bands at once. So I was like, well, for this band, let's play something different. I said, I'll play the keyboard, and Nick played the drums. And uh, I played the keyboard really what I found is that uh, there's a lot less restriction with the keyboard because you don't have anything around your neck holding you down. You can just play and then run around and 
the chicks really like that, the guy who plays the piano ballad, I found. Tom Howell from local band Transition and Jeremy Fought split duties on guitar and bass. Now, all the band needed was to make a decision on who would be their drummer. I got recruited because uh, I was Andy's brother and we were both in the Pillagers together. I think actually originally they had enough guys for whatever reason. I asked them, I just said, hey, you guys are doing that, it sounds like fun. Can I, can I get in on that stuff? Can I play drums maybe for it? And they let me play drums. Flying Aaron would make the most entertaining frontman since David Lee Roth. The Jones brothers and the Anik provided creativity in songwriting. Tom Howell brought a vast knowledge of music and guitar play. The elements were in place. So I got that band together and I said, what should the band be named? And I thought about it for 16 seconds and I said, the flying errands. We didn't even have any songs or anything. Andy and Aaron somehow got us a gig. Our debut performance was at Bishop Knoll Institute in Hammond, Indiana. Uh, we were seniors in high school, except for Nick. Nick had already graduated three years before. It was a thing called a coffee house, where anyone in the school who wanted to express themselves artistically, you know, if you wanted to sing, if you wanted to read a poem, a story you wrote, and to tap dance, anything like that you wanted to do, you could do it on this stage in the cafeteria. Since no one would probably expect like an actual full band to be there, like featuring Aaron. We thought it'd be a cool thing to do, you know. Within a week of that show, I think it was in the week, we wrote the first five Flying Aaron songs, and we had a few practices. Of the first five original Flying Aaron songs, Pictures of Aaron still remains the crowd favorite. Pictures of Aaron it was like the very first Flying Aaron song, actually, I think. And it was kind of supposed to be like a power ballad, but it didn't really turn out that way exactly, but... It's a song that I don't really like, personally. I, if it was up to me, I'd cut it out of our set, but uh, every time you say, Pictures of Aaron, the whole crowd roars and my hair blows back. We'll come uh, running up to the front and watch while we play that one. Who wouldn't want to wake up to this face? No one would want to wake up to that face. It's basically a song about uh, a girl that, maybe a dizziest, dizziest -ish type girl, a girl that's uh, crazy. Uh, you know, that, uh, basically wants what she can't have. In her way of uh, thinking she has what she wants, she has pictures of me, blow-up dolls of me, everything me around her room. It's a song that's saying, you should be happy having pictures of me, because there's only one true love for me, and that's myself. The big debut was shortly approaching. They had to make the most of the little time they had. We had one band practice. We wrote the songs and recorded like little demos of them and gave them to each other, you know. So we had to learn them, but we had one practice the day of the show. And that day, we were practicing, and my keyboard fell and actually broke that day. So I was really upset. I'm like, I can't play keyboard. What am I going to do now? Only hours away from their debut show, Andy's keyboard, along with the dream of the flying errands, appeared to have crashed simultaneously. Coming up next, the show must go on, but will it go on with Andy? And we will see how too much early success leads to feuds within the band and law enforcement when the flying errands continues. Andy Jones was too creative to be left out. The keyboard accident gave birth to Andy Jones as the second frontman of the Flying Aarons. Because of that day, I sang, me and Aaron, Aaron and I sang lead vocals together. And since that day on, that's pretty much how it's been. But, uh, you know, I play a little keyboard here and there. And I remember being nervous that day because I'm thinking, well, I'm never really sang, uh, just sang, you know, I was either playing bass and I could kind of, Use that excuse, well, if I messed up, I was uh, busy playing my wicked bass line, but I just had to sing. We went in there not knowing what to expect, you know, if this went bad, where were we going to stay abandoned and everything, and uh, it went really well. We played seven songs, we played the first five Flying Aaron songs that we wrote, which are Pictures of Aaron, Flying Aaron's theme song, Aaronitis, Two Shannon from Aaron, and Aaron's Digits, and we played Horse With No Name by the band America, 
and we played We're Not Gonna Take It by Twisted Sister. We kicked butt. There were a lot of uh, girls talking to us after the show, so that's always a plus, you know. Um, even if they weren't attractive, you know, you got to start somewhere. That show went over almost too well for our first show. I mean, I think we could have freaked a couple chicks after that show. It went so well. I mean, if people were flipping out, it was really something else. People had never really seen anything like that before. About a month after their debut, Aaron's Appendix was written. I wrote Aaron's Appendix because I was just talking with Aaron one day and he told me he didn't have an appendix. So you gotta be shitting me, dude. I once had an appendix there, one time. And really, um, that song is a deep song for me, really. Um, brings back a lot of memories of my appendix. Um, we, we used to go to the park, swing on the swings. Um, I pushed him, he pushed me. I miss my appendix. So what I did was wrote a whole song learning where his appendix is, you know, it could be anything. And he actually chimed in on a couple of those lyrics and he uh, got a sentence or two that made it to the song. It's deep. Remember that when you hear it. It's not funny, it's deep. While Aaron's appendix brought back painful memories, Aaron's pain would be alleviated by comfort from all of the beautiful women that adore him and his band. At Pillager shows, when we played, there were never any girls. It was always just sweaty dudes running around. <laughs> and uh, there started, and then girls started coming to the Flying Aaron show, probably because of the blatant sexuality exhibited by Aaron and Andy. So now I'm a big rock star and everything, so people really do stuff for me. It's like slaves almost, I guess, but it's fine ladies, fine blondes. And uh, anytime I need anything, they'll do it for me. I'll be, I'll be uh, playing Age of Empires, and I'll be like, oh, Darn, I forgot to get an oil change. And I'll call up, I'll be like, hey, uh, hey, Carisi, go get me some oil change. And she'll be like, again? I'm like, yeah, again, and bring me back some Funyuns, too. And then she'll bring me Funyuns. You know, I, I can do what I want with these ladies. I love them. You guys are best. Love you, Aaron's Angels. This new development inspired Andy Jones to write a song about these lovely vixens. Aaron's Angels, that's a song I wrote because uh, I was listening to our song catalog, and I noticed most of it is just rock. And at that point, you know, I figured, we got to get something that you can shake your buns to, you know? Something that, uh, help you move that big wazoo of yours around the floor. So, we wrote a dance number called Aaron's Angels. It's one of the more different songs. It's one of the more different sounding ones, you know, of a show. That's one of them that sticks out. We just wanted it so you have something to boogie yogi yogi to, instead of just rocking. Because some people, you know, we got some people who like rocking, and we got some people who like boogieing. So we figured we might as well bring the rocks and the boogies and make a roogie right here in the middle or a bach. The success came almost too fast for a young band to handle. Jealousy and arguments within the Flying Errands began. I had a bass player named Jeremy and, uh, and he quit after a couple shows and I don't even really remember why but he announced online because uh, Aaron made fun of him too much. Aaron called him a fag or something. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. Huh? If Jeremy wasn't going out with you, I would. <laughs> After that, Jeremy kind of just didn't want to play with us anymore. I think he was kind of mad at me that I played guitar, and he thought I tried to hog all the songs. It was like Jeremy's first band. It was probably really un unfulfilling for him to be in the Flying Errands for his first band, because he wanted to be like in a in a serious, cool punk band, you know. But, you know, we were, like, funny. He wasn't really down with the funny thing. Even though he was a funny guy, like, as far as in a band, he just didn't want to be in a joke band. He was okay, though, but I don't really talk to him anymore. But maybe he'll see it, so. Hi, Jeremy. We played through the summer, and the band was really falling apart. We lost one of our guitar players, and Nick had mono for the end of the summer, so he, we played a show, actually, with just Aaron, Tom, and myself. It was an acoustic storyteller show. And then uh, after that, we were like, well, let's just take a break. Being a flying Aaron and everything, I haven't gotten much sleep in the last week. Having the success and drama that most local bands experience in their whole careers condensed into one summer, the flying Aaron's were burnt out. Came back about eight months later and played at this guy's house in Merrillville. Ladies and gentlemen, can we get a hand? 
for Flying Ryan Bagley on yeah. bass guitar. Ryan! Flying Ryan! Yes! He won the Be the Flying Aaron's Bass Player for a Week contest. Actually, we had a guy, one of our friends, Ryan, who lives in South Bend by you know, Notre Dame. He came and played on a show. He helped us out. You know, he never became a permanent member, though. He was just there for the one show. Previously, Ryan was a friend of us from the Pillagers, and we had two, two tapes out. And Ryan copied those tapes onto one tape and sold them all over the country. And every couple months, he'd come to our house from South Bend with money. He'd bring us cash and say, hey, here's your latest profits. One of the weirdest guys you'll ever meet in your life. Because he's the type of guy who lives in South Bend. He said, yeah, I'll come over. I'll come practice. And he'd come practice at our house to learn these Flying Aaron songs. He wasn't getting paid or anything. He'd drive that far just to be in the Flying Errands. The fans were excited to welcome back the much-missed Flying Errands. However, the bands they played with were not as supportive. And these people had the nerve, after we brought 90% of the crowd to Maryville from Hammond, these guys had the nerve, let me tell you, to ask us for money for like $80. Can you believe that? So, uh... We told them to go get fucked. The substandard venue wasn't the only problem. The distance from Hammond to South Bend was too far for Ryan Fagley to be a permanent member. I played guitar, and we had the guitar amp going through to the bass amp, try to give it more bass because we didn't have a bass player. And then we had that guy, he came and he practiced once and he couldn't handle the tunes. I showed him the bass line for Aaron's Hot Naked Foreigner experience, and he just kind of, and he, and he didn't play, and he quit. Well, there was a point in time where everyone wanted to be in the Flying Errands. I'm sure that's still going on now, don't get me wrong. But I remember one guy. He kind of looked like the bass guitarist from uh, No Doubt. He came over, you know, he was really excited to try out and everything, and he came over, and I've got five words for you. Man, that guy was a really, really, really bad, stupid moron. He was horrible. And you know... You know, the thing that made me mad, he didn't return my call once. I was going to say, you suck, you moron. And he didn't even return my call. And then he called me back. He, I was on vacation. Uh, I saw you called me. What did you want? You know, because he thought I was going to say, hey, you're in the band, dude. Good job. And I was going to call and say, you are a piece of garbage. And that didn't happen. But then he had the nerve, the nerve to say, well, I didn't like you anyways. And you know what happened then? I had sex with his mom. Many wanted to be in the band, but none had the necessary combination of talent and showmanship. To make matters worse, Aaron and Andy ran into trouble with the law. We thought we were treated unfairly in our felony arrests. Aaron versus the Police was a song that was inspired by some altercations Aaron and I had with law enforcement. Um, particularly uh, with like tickets, felony arrests, you know, things like that. You know, that song brings back memories. Mean, mean memories. Cops used to harass me. Harass me! Very rude cops. And you know what? I got fed up. Just like the, the average American would get fed up. And I did. Those cops, they used to harass myself and Andy, call me dick. Me a dick? Just because I'm better than them? Just because their daughter wants to date me, I'm a dick. You know what? That song just makes me so mad. It, it it burns my it it burns me up. You know, it burns me. So we wrote that song kind of as a hey, you can make us pay you all this money and do community service and uh, ruin our lives and we'll never be able to get good jobs. But hey, this song is talking bad about you. Because Andy and Aaron. Uh went through a phase that they may or may not be out of by now, I'm not sure. Where they went around like throwing eggs at people and all that kind of stuff. And I think it was just because they like uh, show jackass a lot. It's really jackass influence because they got arrested one time. And uh, they got arrested one time. And it was really clearly their fault, but they decided, hey, let's be big babies about it and write an anti-police song. But as a song, it's a good one. I like it a lot. What do you think of that, copper? The combination of legal trouble and the inability to find a steady fifth member put the future of the Flying Errands 
in jeopardy. Coming up next, the band undergoes yet another lineup change. Also, the flying errands soar higher than ever, attaining fame, fans, and ladies worldwide. Oh, you want to know about hot naked border? Also, more problems with the police arise during a return performance at Bishop Knoll. Because they called the motherfucking police on a brother. When the flying errands return. Here we go. Flying errands, Greg Green. I taped the headphones to my head because I couldn't hear this song. The addition of Greg to drums in 2003, it was kind of frustrating at first because, like, at that point, we taught a few different people the songs in, like, the same couple of months, so it was... It's really getting on my nerves. I don't like teaching people our songs like over and over again. I don't like starting over every show. And when Greg came in, we had to start over and teach him all the songs on the drums. And you know what? It turned out well. Greg is a pretty intense uh, performer, which is something we didn't know when we got him in the band. I have to unfortunately take most of the blame for Greg being in the Flying Errands because um, I I played with him first in the Small Time Crooks, and I. I told Andy and Aaron, I was like, hey, well, since we can't find... Because we had a bass player who quit, and we needed a guy, and we're like, oh, well, I could go, and I could play guitar and bass and everything, but we need a drummer, and I knew Greg, and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just one of those things where even if you have doubts about it, you still go for it, and it, when it turns out disastrous, you realize that I should have listened to my doubts. No, I like Greg. The only thing Greg brought to the band was one more idiot, and we needed an idiot in the band, so we got Greg. Greg's got the right uh, attitude as far as uh, as far as being in the Flying Errands. He's he's uh, got the same level. He's got the same sense of humor and uh, same level of wackiness that that we need for the Flying Errands. So, you know, he hasn't really changed anything, but he's added to it. Greg brings some fans to the show, so I like that. He brings us a couple of fans. Greg Reed's debut with the Flying Errands was a financial success. After that show, the Flying Errands returned to where it all began. I can't believe this many beautiful people attend Bishop Knoll. <laughs> oh, you guys, we love you guys. You guys played here once before. Um, you guys can play as long as you want. It'll be great. You know, do whatever. You know, just don't swear or anything like that. But um, you can play as long as you want, as many songs. Well... Well, there's no money in it, but we figured we'd give back to the community. We're charitable guys. Why not, you know? We've already had enough success. You can't have it all. So anyway, what we did, we said, sure. But they were worried about us. They said, you guys are borderline indecent. Borderline indecent. So we're going to need you to sign this contract, all five of you, next to your name, saying that you won't do anything indecent or obscene. And we said, well, we can do that for one day. We do that most of the days of our lives. Then uh, they started pulling some crap some magnanimous crap they introduced us before we sat we set up they said ladies and gentlemen the flying errands and there was like nothing on the stage so then we had to set up they're like what's taking you guys so long it turns out they overbooked the show oh so you know we're on the stage setting up and they're like hurry up hurry up hurry up hurry up hurry up we're like hey we got 45 minutes we signed a contract we're gonna do our thing right when i started playing one of the teachers came up to me and said, right, if you're just going to try to blow the roof off this place with your amplifier, we're going to kick you out of here. And some little gnome tree stump little thing came running up to me and yeah. said, Aaron, Aaron, you guys can only play one more song. We were like, bitch, please. We prepared 45 minutes of material. And, and we I ain't getting paid. We're going to let these people hear our material. Yeah. We came there to see the people of Bishop Knoll. Sold out. The people of Bishop Knoll came there to see us. Sold out. Sold out. That place, that's a goddamn big fucking shit. And yeah, you know. There was something else. And they're like, hey, you guys got to get off the stage. Pretty much what happened is Aaron ran off the He walked off. And then Andy walked off and came back. I had to get out of that negative mental state. Because I'm only positive energy. So I took a walk. I came back. I sang the rest of that song. Andy Andy swore into the microphone. And I said something along the lines of, Hey, Bishop Noel, thanks for nothing because this is fucking bullshit. 
He ain't lying. He said. Yeah, it. so I broke my contract for the sole purpose and sole reason that they broke their contract with us first. You dig? Bishop Knoll Institute lied to us. Went Julius Caesar on us. Some some lady, I don't even know who it was, trying to instigate stuff, trying to get Andy to make a mistake so the security could do something to him, I think, because she was uh, trying to get in everybody's face and we were trying to leave. And it, he, he was just like, hey, go get fucked. And it was like, actually it was with the left hand. Mm -hmm. it was, I gave her an up and down. I, I, I said, first I'm thinking, who the fuck are you? So I said, hey, go get fucked. I told her, you get fucked, lady. Mm -hmm. you, and, and then what happened? Lady. They, they called the police. They called the police because I said, hey, you go get fucked. She didn't have any balls to, to bring it. She said, go get fucked. She said, I can't because I'm a fucking loser. So mm -hmm. I'm going to call the police. And, you know, I've been in some previous uh, trouble with the law. A couple, couple times. I had about seven months until my... Um, Probation. My probation was over. I had to get the fuck out of there. I hit it in a minute. I was gone. <laughs> Police were like, they're still on the phone. I, I was already outside. in my shower. I look outside. I said, where'd he go? I said, where'd he go? So it was just a bad experience all around. But it, but it's it's a story, I guess. <sighs> Who's this, Aaron? Whose knife is this? That's what Bishop Knoll's knife. Property of Bishop Knoll. Mm -hmm. It's a Bishop Knoll letter opener. Mm -hmm. A2, Bishop Knoll. A2. That's a shame. After we gave you... Four years of pure joy. And you know Four what? Four years and summers for me. Yeah, some one summer for me, algebra. Later that summer, the Flying Aarons celebrated their Polish heritage by appearing in Whiting, Indiana's Pierogi Fest. And then Pierogi Fest, which is something Nick is uh, obsessed with, was coming up and he said, hey, I got an idea. I'll write a polka song and, you know, we'll use it for the Flying Aarons and we'll record it and sell it at pierogi fest and like promote our band by using a polka and it, i was like no that's stupid you horse's ass playing Aaron's polka was written specifically for the pierogi fest in 2003. well i thought that's a good feeling because i had a little old uh piece of music laying around uh, kind of a polka thing and i didn't have anything to do with it so uh we recorded that in about a week like now, I'm really glad it's my favorite Flying Aaron song to play and to listen to, so I'm really glad Nick did that and wrote it. And I'm really glad I didn't shoot him down bad enough where he didn't do it. Number one Polish song in the world. Best polka song ever. This is Gregory coming from the Flying Aarons. Uh, it's some sort of army vehicle. Oh, really? Definitely used for killing. It's off. Killing machine. Got a generator, two huge amps. Some 15s, we're gonna power it up tonight. This is too much Baby, steam. we're going all the way. But we had a lot of fun at Pierogi Fest, and I think we I think we tested a few people's, uh, we tested the patience of some people, as far, as far as public decency, I suppose. Greg and Aaron had huge boners the whole time. And a couple times, a couple times they bumped into each other's. <laughs> By recording international music, it was only a matter of time before women from overseas took notice of Flying Aaron, which led to the inspiration behind Aaron's Hot Naked Foreigner Experience. This song is a true story. One time I was cutting the grass behind my uh, garage in the field, and when he's underneath those power lines mowing, he sees this woman, and he says, Woo! Woo! And she's this hot naked foreigner lady. You know, she approached me, we talked, you know, we, we hit it off, I guess you can say. You know, one thing led to another, and I was uh, laying in the field by myself. You know, uh, and I must say, it was good. Aaron's Hot Naked Foreigner Experience. <clears throat> that song, when we debuted it, it had that techno part in the middle. And we're like, you know, since on that part of the song, it's played on a drum machine, no one's playing any instruments, we figured we had to do something special. We have to give the people something to see, you know? We're not just gonna stand there and pretend we're playing. So what we did, the first time we played it, we danced with glow sticks. And then we watched the tape of it and we're like, oh, that was okay, we can do better. So we sat down and choreographed a dance. We were watching an NSYNC video, and their choreography is gay, they just dance. So we figured we gotta do something that's different. What? Are we changing anything? Oh, well, what are you guys doing during the video? I can't walk. With my arms can't. Yeah, my... But they basically do one of these, and the guy walks, and he's a wheelbarrow, and he walks, and I'm over here, I'm right here, and I shovel into their wheelbarrow. It was choreographed in probably like an hour. 
it's caught on. I go around, I go shopping, I go to restaurants, and it's funny because I see people doing that outside the restaurants, doing the wheelbarrow dance, and uh, it's kind of flattering. Even more flattering are the many fans that now turn to the flying errands, not only for entertainment, but as a way to live their lives. What would Aaron do? Um, basically, I mean, this is easy. Everyone can figure this out. It's a, it's a song to start a new religion over, the religion of Aaron. You know, I mean, everything's out there for you. You don't need a Bible. You just look at the song. What would Aaron do? If you have a problem in your life, you have a little predicament, and you're not sure which way to go, there's a fork in the road, not sure which way to go, and you just can't figure it out. You think, you look at your little bracelet that says WWAD, what would Aaron do? Aaron would go that way, and then you follow that way. So it's really a problem solver. Oh, it's a really good, uh, really good rock and roll song, and I'm really, I'm really happy that Andy lets me sing the beginning part by myself. That's like one of my favorite parts of the show. The Flying Errands closed out the latter months of 2003 and ushered in 2004 with a series of holiday themed shows. My favorite Flying Errands performance has to be our Halloween show. So far it's the Halloween show because we started that show off with a medley of uh, spooky hits, some spooktacular hits. I was the masturbating bear from the Conan O'Brien show. And, I, and coincidentally I actually look like this without clothes on. This is about right. Which is why I wear clothes usually. The Flying Errands last show of 2003 was a twisted tribute to our forefathers on the eve of Thanksgiving. On Thanksgiving we wrote a play and uh, we took all of our songs and put them in an order where they told a story that was the story of the play where Aaron was a pilgrim and the rest of the band were Indians and Aaron was by himself and we celebrated uh, our first Thanksgiving together. And, you know, throughout the duration of the play, there was uh, a lot of different types of things going on. Like Aaron uh, had intercourse with my wife, and then we gave him the key to the city. I got hosed on that call. I don't know what happened. The Thanksgiving show ended a banner year for the Flying Errands. But what does the future have in store for this creative group? Coming up next, we learn more about these men behind the madness and achieve speeds of 88 miles an hour to look into the future. Then you guys are ready for that yet, so your kids will love it. When the flying errands return. And see, the thing with the flying errands, we started off as a joke, but once I realized the intensity that Aaron had, and it was, it's almost equal to mine, because I'm a pretty intense guy. So he's pretty close to my intensity. I realized we have the same passion. So we kept it going, and we're pushing it as far as we can, and so far we've been having a lot of fun, and uh, gigantic amounts of success. I'm, I'm always 100, 110%. I'm always flying Aaron 25 hours a day, so I feel that uh, no one's ever better than me. My performance is always top shelf, and uh, you know, Everybody else sucks, basically. The band sucks, and I'm the one carrying them. There's a song called Aaron Sucks. That's a song I wrote, and it was uh, after we were doing the band for a few months. I didn't really realize that the uh, joke of Aaron being cool would actually make people believe that he is cool. I thought they uh, knew that it was sarcastic, but apparently they didn't. I grew furious with this and uh, wrote the song Aaron Sucks to Know, really exhibit my true emotions about Aaron because I'm the star of the band, I'm not the ham, I'm the whole pig. Aaron's a little chopped, uh, chuleta. Despite the occasional squabbles between band members, they remain brothers, willing to help each other out. Like when Aaron needed a love song to show his softer side in their ballad, Because I'm Aaron. That song is basically Aaron's desperate plea to get women. Written by Nick. Aaron wasn't getting enough tang. He wasn't getting as much as uh, Nick and I. So he's like, could you guys write me a sensitive ballad? So, you know, some girls will try to F me. 
and uh, it hasn't worked yet. Because of Aaron is a song we made to show that we had a serious side. It's a song that's different from the rest in the way that it's not jumping around, we're not uh, as entertaining almost, but we're showing that we can play the music, we can uh, have our sensitive side. It's telling the, the listener that, don't be afraid of me because I am Aaron. I know I'm better than you, but don't be afraid, come talk to me. We might hit it off, you know? You're afraid, cause I'm me. Bullshit, it should be. You're afraid, cause I'm a geek. It's only natural for tension to be amongst creative performers who have been together so long. Let us now learn more about the individual elements that make up the flying errands. I think I first became interested in music. Well, I actually got a first guitar like after uh, freshman year. I've been playing for like five or six years. Metallica and bands like that. Tom, 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 where do I begin? Tom's a dickhead. <laughs> He's a... Uh, he tries to show off a lot up on stage. He tries to show me up on the drums. Working with Tom is pleasant. Tom's a nice guy and he's a very good musician. Working with Tom, working with Tom is a real blessing because Tom's one of those musician guys. We in the Flying Errands, for the most part, are entertainers. Where music is kind of, it's important, but Tom is a musician, Tom's a classical guitar player, so every once in a while you learn something from Tom. Having Tom around's nice. He actually can teach you a thing or two about music. That's when I came around the Flying Errands, and uh, they were, uh, they were my inspiration, my, uh, my devotion through life after the Small Time Crooks. I actually wrote a song uh, for the Small Time Crooks. Let me play it for you. Here it goes. Uh, it's in C minor. Hey, you, I saw you by the fountain. Hey, you, my heart dropped like a mountain. Hey, you, you smell like a flower. Love it made me cower. Oh, and it goes off into this crazy guitar solo. I don't want to do it right now. I like working with Greg. I've actually known him from before Flying Irons because he was in my confirmation class. So never imagined I'd be in a band with him, but it was kind of cool since I already knew him from before. Working with Greg. Well. I must say it's, uh, it really demands 195% of your work since he only puts in about 3%. Greg is uh, equal to, I'd say, a uh, piece of diarrhea. You know, it's not even a piece. He's just basically liquid playing drums, you know. That's all I could say, but I guess he's good. So the addition of Greg has been nice, even though uh, every time I see him he says, oh, I don't know when I'm going to be able to practice. I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it until the day of the show. Mm, I'll bring a pizza over. Asshole. Though at times Greg is the victim of some good-natured ribbing by his fellow band members, when all is said and done, they do appreciate his hard work and talent. It's tough playing drums. I'd say it's probably tougher. You're the one who's uh, directing the entire song, and it's all relied on whether or not you can keep the, the tempo going consistently. So it's a little bit difficult, because if you mess up on guitar, you just... you can put your fingers up and down the guitar and do a little noise and make it look like you did it on purpose. But drums, if you like drop a stick or if you miss the beat, then it's a little bit tougher. Working with Mick is fun just because he's really good at guitar. I've always been the ambitious one of the two. Nick's been the talent, but he's been afraid to express himself. I never had any talent. I just expressed myself. In this case, I just went for. I've I've always been known to go for it. In this case, you can uh, you can cross reference the word ambitious with the word foolish. Nick Nick is a big guy on holidays. Uh, he likes to write uh, songs for every holiday, make CDs, pass them out, give them his gifts. Writing music is for me is a almost painful experience because it's very frustrating most of the time. But I have to say that pretty uh, consistently, I'm happy with what comes out. When we write songs, we almost never work together. It's like 100% by me or 100% by him. We don't really collaborate because we don't like anyone's ideas more than our own. And that's just uh, the arrogance that comes with us because we're Polish. Nick and brother Andy may not collaborate well, but their results are top-notch. We're not trying to keep up with the Joneses. We are the Joneses. 
Nick was also the man responsible for showing younger sibling Andy the ropes, or should we say strings. Nick's my brother, my older brother, and really the guy who taught me how to play music, taught me how to play the guitar. I was like 13 or 14 years old. Aside from music, Nick Jones has quite an interesting array of hobbies and activities. Sleeping, for the most part, and pooping. <laughs> and if possible, doing both at the same time. I I'm working on that one. I first became interested in music at a very young age. And the first band I liked was Kiss. Now, when I was in kindergarten, we had these tables. Four kids sat at each table. And uh, one of the first conscious memories I have in my whole life was writing Kiss on that table with one of those big, fat kindergarten pencils. I think I met him from baseball, actually. I don't remember, but we played, I think we played at Robertsdale, like Babe Ruth, like 13-year-old league. And I remember he was on my team because we used to sit on the bench and like eat candy and make fun of the people who were actually playing, so. You know, pretty much everything as far as in the arts and entertainment area has been with Andy. I really can't, uh, Describe it because I don't really know what it's like without working with Andy. I'm not really sure. So it's just the way it's always been. Andy, I like in the band because uh, he puts so much effort into everything. It makes me. It makes my job a lot easier. I'm inspired by like comedy movies or stand-up comedians, TV shows like Kids in the Hall. Big Kids in the Hall fan. I don't like to listen to music when I'm gonna write music because. I think it'll sound too much like that. I've really looked up to Andy as a, as a hero, mentor, and a, a good all-around kind of guy. I know he uh, definitely looks at me the same way. Um, an interest I have is uh, comedy. I've actually done a lot of stand-up comedy, and I've taken class at Second City in Chicago for improvisational acting. I might be a little bit more interested in comedy and acting than I am in music, but we combine the music, acting, and comedy in The Flying Air. So it's really a nice outlet for me, creatively. And what I use the band for, personally, is a launch pad to my acting career. Because I want someone to... I'm in this band so someone discovers me. And then I could be, like, cop on NYPD Blue or something or other. Or, like, I could be one of the guys jamming Sarah Jessica Parker on that show. Aaron is, uh... He's kind of like a superstar, actually. Working with Aaron is an adventure most of the time. He's unpredictable and he almost falls on you when we're playing. Like, he'll almost, like there have been many times where he almost, he almost jumped on me or accidentally kicked me in the face or something. But overall, it's fun. He really believes he's gonna be Millionaire Flying Aaron. And because deep down inside, he really believes it and he's doing what he wants to, I think he's gonna make it. My uh, artistic influence is probably Jim Carrey's one, if you see when I do my dance with my leg. Play the guitar. I learned that from him in Once Bitten. I got a lot from uh, Russell Crowe in Gladiator. Genghis Khan, he helped me out a lot. I really learned a lot from him. He, uh, he had a really uh, sensitive side, and that's how I got my sensitive side, really. And uh, every great performer needs a sensitive side, you know? He gets up on stage, and he, he, does, and he, he does all these things, and all these, uh, all these wonderful things on stage, and I, I just know he's doing them for me. He gets all the attention, so definitely he's a good uh, focus for the band. Like Jennifer Lopez, Flying Aaron not only sings, but can act as well. There's always a career in comedy for the Flying Aaron, you know. I went to Second City a few semesters, uh, was uh, head of my class, valedictorian. Even with their busy lives and hectic schedules, the band still remembers who it is that made them successful. The fans, uh, they can't get enough of us. They, they come to our shows, they listen to us at home, they listen to us in their heads. I'll be hauling my guitar out to the car and people like some guy will be standing there and he'll say hey you guys are like my favorite band ever um as far as the flying errands go we haven't gotten any panties yet and i'm kind of upset about that and the pillagers we got a couple sets but uh in the flying errands we got nothing so far but i have uh bagged way more chicks from the flying errands than i ever could have in the pillagers most of those don't wear underpants those are the type of girls we get with. The fans of the Flying Errands, you know, they really resemble the band. There's no fans greater than our fans. When we want to get pumped up, when we want to get moving around, the fans are the ones that motivate us to get moving around. The fans are basically our heart. They make our blood flow. They make us move from side to side, make us dance, make us sing, make us 
perform. I love the fans. Okay. At a lot of our concerts, we have uh, different contest giveaways. I host the contest. It's in the middle of the set. We do that to keep the fans involved. You know, it's not a really exciting show when you just play music, sing, like every other band around. And really, uh, what they get is like stuff. It's not like, oh, you get a sticker. That's like the runner-up prize. But if you win the grand prize, you get something that we spent a couple hours on making specifically for that one, that one show, one prize, that's it. And then no one else in the world has it. It's just one time. We don't even have the stuff. And we draw pictures and make art and frame it for you. We like to give a good prize. Something that's going to, in 10 years, be sold on eBay for probably like $6 million. It's really neat stuff. No one else is doing that. And that's one reason why we are the best local band ever. In five years, I see the Flying Aaron's performing live in front of uh, multitudes of audiences across the country, across the nation, across the, uh, the skies. Flying errands. Um, I see them on everything you see. You go to the grocery store, we're going to be on Wheaties. You go on the expressway, we're going to be on a billboard. You go to Zimbabwe, we're going to be on a stage in Zimbabwe. Babies are Russ, we're going to be on baby clothes. You go to the strip club, we're going to be on strippers. You name it, we're there. We're going to be basically like, we're going to be SARS. We're going to be the SARS outbreak, but it's going to be the Flying errands outbreak. Everyone's going to get it. We're the most fun band you're going to find. Um, lots of smiles. Jump on the bandwagon now before the bandwagon jumps on you. Thank you, good night. One more time. One more time. One more time. And, um, you know, so we, we said okay. Poopsie put us together. Hey, Poops, what happened to your ankle? See, Poops broke his ankle. Ah, Poops, you gonna make it? <laughs> you ain't lying. Hey, guys, what's going on? Hey, Nick. <laughs> I mean, Dick. Our... Pecker. <laughs> this is our time, Nick. You've had your time. Can't you just, uh... You're so irresponsible. Take your spotlight and then let us have our spotlight? Can't you, like, let it be even between the band? <laughs> I bet Poopsie's head. That's how we, we poop see each other. Uh, Nick's actually 43 years old. Some people think he looks younger than he is, but uh, he's really 43. He's an old piece of crap. Andy and Aaron had no idea what they were just talking about. They're so full of crap. They don't remember anything. Should have asked me that question. Now, which artist is most like me? Brendan Fraser here. Ooh, and this hot piece of tang right next to him. Ooh wee. Girl, you want a hit? My type of lady. Tell us what it was like growing up with Andy. Um, kind of like this. You wouldn't leave me alone. Convert to a boy band. They say I'd probably have to take like 50 bucks for each guy. We have integrity. We're not like sellouts or anything. Talking about Greg again, huh? Because this is my interview. How am I doing? Did I blow it yet? Well, what was your reaction when you first heard of the flying errands? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that performance is probably <laughs> as bad as that fart one of these guys blew. <laughs> really? <laughs> That's some shit. <laughs> Real doozy. Damn! My father, he gives me lots of coupons, and I go get lottery tickets for him quite often. I'd be willing to play the guitar if that means uh, getting in her pants. If you hold on for a second. That's a waste of your tape. Mm -hmm. That's like a half hour of crap. <laughs>